Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 8. If you remember in chapter 6, there was a murmuring among the widows in the church. Those who were Jewish and those who had taken on the Greek philosophy and lifestyle and lingo and language. And the apostle said, it's not meet that we should leave the ministry of prayer and the word to serve these tables, to deal with this issue. And so they said, you need to pick out from among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, that they may attend to this business. And they did just that. And they chose Stephen, who we recently wrapped up our study of, an amazing man of God, the very first martyr in the church. If you remember, the next individual in that list, his name was Philip. And that's who we're going to focus on in our study today. He was second listed, and now he's second in our study in the book of Acts. And we're going to focus in this chapter on a lot of different things, probably going to be all over the place, so put on your seatbelt. There may be a little bit of turbulence, hopefully not. But we're going to look at preaching. There's a lot of emphasis on preaching in this chapter, and we need to be reminded of the importance of that and what that really is. There's an emphasis on places. So we're going to take note of those places, and then we're going to look at some promptings, how God leads his people, and a lot of that we're going to see in the life of Philip. So we're just going to jump right in. We're moving away from the first martyr, and we're looking at the first missionary. The first missionary, starting in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, says this, And Saul was consenting, or voting, he was a part of the Sanhedrin, that Jewish Supreme Court. He was giving his approval to the stoning of Stephen. And it says, at that time, there was a great persecution. We'll see how the Lord leads, but maybe you've noticed this word great being repeated in our study of the book of Acts. It's megas in the Greek. And maybe when we get to chapter 15, we'll go back and review all of the greats up until this point. But this is one of the greats, great persecution. Now, we don't, we don't like great persecution, but Paul writes to Timothy and he says, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So put that in your promise book. It's an important one. We need to, we need to know that. There was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the place to be, man. That's where it was happening. I mean, that's where the Holy Spirit was poured out. That's where deacons were formed. That's where people dropped dead in church services. I mean, that was the happening place. But I want to remind you, while we're here in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We're in chapter 8, verse 1, but we need to, to keep our focus on Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said this, And ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. It's important for us to Take note of that while we're here, because there's great persecution. One of the ways the Lord leads us, especially those believers like me, who are a little slow, a little stubborn, he uses circumstances. As a matter of fact, when I look back over my life, and I think of those big moments, those big life-changing moments, including my salvation, I might add, I can't take credit and say, oh, well, you know, I just sensed the Lord was leading and God spoke and said this, that, or the other. And in faith and obedience, I just followed along. 
That's not my testimony. If that's your testimony, praise God. I'd like to spend some time with you because I'd like to become more like you. That hasn't been the case with me. Most everything that God has done in my life, he just did it. Because he knew if he waited for me, it probably wouldn't happen. When I got saved, I wasn't looking to get saved. Some of your testimony is, well, you know, there was this life-changing moment in my life, and I just kind of sensed God, and, and I was seeking the Lord, and I was on this quest in search. Not me. I got begged to death by a friend to go to church. I finally went to church. I didn't want to be there. I can't tell you what the message was, but God saved me that night. I wasn't looking for him at all, but he radically saved my life, and the rest has been pretty much the same. It hasn't been, okay, Lord, we need to do this now. It's been, God just did it. He's doing that right now in the church, and I believe he's doing that right now in the church. I believe some of the things that are happening around us and to us that we're blaming on one another and others, I believe God is right in the middle of it. Do you know that a mama eagle makes this beautiful fluffy little nest high up in the trees and it's just so soft and cushy for the little eggs to be in. And then those little eggs get warm under mama, and there's a little moving and a quaking and a shaking, and next thing you know, there's a little eaglet, but then that little eaglet gets a little bit bigger, and there's not a room in the nest for mama and the eaglets. And you know what mama does? She starts taking the soft stuff out of the nest. You might be going through a time in your life, a season where it's just... It's a little, a little uncomfortable. It might very well be the Lord trying to get you to move. Because you've become complacent in your cushy, comfy, cozy little atmosphere. And notice it says, there was this great persecution in Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad. That's the title of our study today, scattered abroad. Now there's, there's more than one Greek word that Luke could have used here for scattered. There's, there's a Greek word, as a matter of fact, one of the religious leaders used it when we were in Acts chapter 5. You remember Gamaliel? When the disciples were in trouble and they were being persecuted and threatened, Gamaliel says, wait a minute, listen, do you remember this guy and those that followed him? And you remember that guy over here and, and, and the 400 that followed him? Well, they took that guy out and those followers were scattered. It means to be dispersed like ashes in the wind. A person is cremated, they take their ashes wherever that little special place is, and they take those ashes and into the wind, and it's dispersed, it dissipates, it dissolves everywhere. And then there's the Greek word that is used in scattering seed. As a sower sows seed, it's not aimless, it's not thoughtless, it's to bring forth fruit. There's a scattering taking place. You think you're at the job you're at by coincidence, by chance, and some of you even maybe by mistake. God scatters his children all over the place to bring forth fruit. Well, they were scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, notice, except the apostles. Now, we don't know why those guys stayed there. Maybe, maybe they thought, we remember the cross. We remember the garden. We, we remember, especially Peter, I should have stood with the Lord. I should have been there. I, I, I should have been courageous. I, I, I sh but we all ran. We all hid. We were all scared. We all fled for our lives. Not again. Not again, not this time. We're not doing it. We're going to stay put. We don't know. We're speculating. That's dangerous, by the way. We don't know, but they stayed there. But notice, verse 2 says, And devout men, which typically is used in the Scripture to describe Jewish individuals, not believers. Devout men. These were men who saw what happened to Stephen, and 
they weren't happy about it. They weren't a part of it. They recognized that this, this wasn't right. This was not the thing to do. And these devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. We're not going to talk about Saul right now. We'll get to him soon enough. Verse 4. Therefore, they were scattered abroad. There's that word again, that phrase. And they went everywhere. Everywhere. Where does the Lord want the gospel to go? Everywhere. They went everywhere and notice what they did. They ran for their lives, scared as chickens, and never said another thing ever again. Nope. They went everywhere preaching the word. They went everywhere preaching politics. Gordon, watch it. You're going to get in trouble. They went everywhere preaching social issues. Um, maybe no, no. They went everywhere preaching the word. Dear Saint, let me remind you this morning, brother, sister, you have one message, one subject matter, and it falls between these two covers. That's the conversation piece. That's what God's called you to. You can't talk about what you don't know, so you need to know it. And once you know it, you need to share it. We'll talk about that some more. They preach the word. Let's get going, Gordon. Come on now. I'm getting warmed up. Pray for me. Verse 5. Then Philip went. He just went. Circumstances are behind it. He probably wouldn't have moved if he didn't have to, but now he has to, so he's on his way. Notice to the city of Samaria. He went down to Samaria. You always go down from Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem. Everywhere you go from Jerusalem, you go down. He goes down to Samaria. Now, Samaria in 722, the Assyrians came in, ransacked Israel. They took all of the important people out of Israel. They left the poor, the low-class individuals. And then they, they imported, if you will, pagan people. And they married one another. And the result of that is what was called the Samaritans. Jews considered them half-breeds. There was great prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. And Philip heads to a place where most Jews would have never went. Would have never went. But I'd like to remind you of someone else who went there first. If you remember in our study of John chapter 4, it says this, something very interesting, because if you know the geography of where Samaria is, what, Jesus, what, what John says about Jesus doesn't make sense in the natural, but it said this, he must needs go through Samaria. Now, if he would have said that out loud, everyone would have said, no, you don't need to go through Samaria. You don't have to go through Samaria to get to where you're going. But Jesus would beg to differ. He says, I must needs go. When he gets there, he has an encounter, if you remember, with a woman. A woman at a well, and I wonder if she's doing well. Philip has gone down there. But Jesus had already sown the seeds in this place. And I want you to see the response. Philip goes down to Samaria, but first notice at the end of verse 5, what does he do? He preaches politics to him. He talks about Trump, talks about Biden. No. He, 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 he talks about social issues and injustice. Nope. He preaches Christ unto them. Brothers and sisters, if you want to change a country that you love, offer it Christ, not conservatism or liberalism. That's what got us into this mess. Can I remind you and me that we're ambassadors? We're not from here. 
We have a dual citizenship. But we represent a king whose name is Jesus. I'll talk to you about your president if you want to. But I'd rather spend time talking about, and the conversation will go if I have anything to say about it, to Jesus. Because your president's not going to help you. Whether his name starts with a T or a B. But I can tell you one whose name starts with a J. And he will change everything. He preached Christ unto them. The church needs to be reminded of that this morning. And notice verse 6, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Wait a minute. Philip's not an apostle. They told me that these miracles ceased with the apostles. Now, I've already noticed two guys in the book of Acts that are not apostles. And they're working miracles. Now, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Miracles are doing, being done. And notice verse 7. Unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. They were delivered from demons and from disease and from deformities. These great miracles that were taking place in this city and notice verse 8 you know God's doing something when verse 8 is the commentary and there was great joy in that city great joy the fruit of the Spirit is love manifested first 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 in the list joy joy Jesus brings joy. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know joy. But if you do, you will. If you allow Jesus to free you, if you allow him to heal you, if you'll allow him to do what he does, he's the savior, he's the deliverer. If you'll let him be Lord of your life, your life will be filled with joy. There was great joy in the city. But as life is in a fallen world, notice verse 9, first word, but. <laughs> it's going to always be there, people. This side of heaven, there's always going to be a but. But there was a certain man named Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Do you know that people are looking for a great one? The world is looking for a great one. And unfortunately, the church is still looking for a great one. We know the great one. But many in the church are looking for a great one. And let me just tell you, the one pulling the stream, strings behind the puppet stage is prepping, priming the people of this world for a great one who we know from the scripture is antichrist. And there's only one way to stay out of that trap. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I can't tell you how many times over the last couple decades people say, hey, Gordon, do you think this president's the antichrist? Do you think this president's the Antichrist? For some, Obama was the Antichrist. For some, Trump has been the Antichrist. And now talk's already swirling. Is Biden the Antichrist? Because if you look at his name in the Hebrew. Oh, y'all been on Facebook too, haven't you? All right, all right. Let me just say, if you understand the scripture, in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, there is one restraining the revelation of that Antichrist. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. I've got my eyes on the skies. I'm looking for him. Because when I get out of here, and your, your theology may be a little different, that's okay. You have every right to be wrong. 
I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And you know what? When the rapture takes place, whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and it is pre, but just saying, <laughs> you're going with me. So you can want to go in the middle, but you're not going to. Would that be okay if, if the Lord just takes you before? Would, we, would that upset you? I hope not. But anyway, there's a restrainer. The Holy Spirit is restraining this individual. And this is what opens the world up. Paul tells us that in the last days, there's going to be a strong delusion. If you want to know why President Obama was so popular with the masses of people and why Trump was so popular with the masses of people, people are, people are longing they're looking for one to come along with the answers, with the solutions, who will fix stuff, who will make stuff right. And we already know who that one is. And Philip goes down to Samaria and says, I know his name. It's Jesus. And they receive him and there's great joy. Now I can look across America and tell you, they're not looking to Jesus. Because you'll search high and low for joy in this country. There's hatred and division. People foaming at the mouth like they're rabid dogs. And I've had to repent because I've acted that way too. Because I forgot who I am. And I forgot who he is. And I forgot where I was going. And I forgot the only thing that'll change anything and everything. He's bewitching the people they're looking for. And verse 10 says, And to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Let me just tell you this morning, I don't think anybody thinks this, but just by chance, there's one. I am not the great power of God. I'm going to tell you what my grandfather always said about every man he encountered he puts his pants on one leg at a time just like you Gordon is who I am a disciple of Christ pastor is what I do I didn't earn that title the Lord called me to that just like he called you to whatever he's called you to and your calling is no less than mine they thought he was this great one and everybody's looking for a great one and verse 11 says unto him they regarded because that for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching, here's that word again, he's preaching, what is he preaching? Politics. Nope, religion, nope. He's preaching things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Can I remind you of a passage of Scripture back in John? This is important for us to note, and, and Philip learns this lesson today. Oh, there's so much that I want to share. John chapter 2, verses 30, 23 through 25. You don't have to turn there. You can just jot it now. I'm going to read it out loud to you. Now when he, Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify of man for he knew what was in man. John says the same thing that Luke says. All these miracles are taking place and people are believing and they're being baptized. And it would be easy to assume that everybody, everybody was in. I'll just leave that there. Maybe it'll make more sense as we go on. Verse 14. I like this. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. We, we got to send some people from the mothership. <laughs> we, we need to sanction this thing. We, we need to go down there and make sure everything's going all right. I've had people ask me, well, Gordon, who you under? What you talking about? Who's your covering? Jesus? No, that won't work. 
I had somebody take me to lunch at the beginning of Solomon's porch. I mean, really, get, they brought me this book. <laughs> it wasn't this one. They brought me this book, and they set this book down and said, you need to read this book, brother. Because you're about to venture out into this, and you need yourself a covering. You need to be under somebody. I said, brother, I am. I'm under the lordship of Christ. Well, you, you can't, it don't work that way. Well, that's what my Bible tells me. Well, ain't what this book here says. Well, you, you keep that book. If that book contradicts this book, I, I don't want to read that book. He, they sent him Peter and John. Now, oh, I wish we had a lot of time. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem. And he was passing through Samaria. And the Samaritans, remember the prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans, they got upset that Jesus was passing by and he wasn't going to stay. And it was James and John who says to Jesus about this time, Lord, would you have us call down fire from heaven like Elijah? Let's go nuclear, Lord. Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you are of. And it's interesting that these guys are now at Samaria. Because notice what they're going to do. Who, when they were come down, they prayed again. Now, there was a time they were wanting to pray down fire. See, if you walk with Jesus and you allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in you, he'll change you. If that change isn't happening, you need to check your walk. These guys were the sons of thunder, and Peter was the hand, foot, and mouth disease guy. And now the, it's just like the Lord. It's just like the Lord to have these two guys praying for these people in this city, the Samaritans, that at one time, Lord, nuke them. Make them crispy critters, Lord. And I hope and pray those of us in this room who have thought that we should call down fire upon whatever, conservatives, liberals, whatever. I hope the Lord puts us in a position where we have to be more like him and minister to the same people that we once looked down our snooty little nose at. Because that's the only thing that's going to change our heart and cause us to see people the way God does. Jesus had no problem with the Samaritans. As a matter of fact, he taught a parable of a good Samaritan. Well, there's so many stay on point, Gordon. To pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So they're now praying that fire would come, but it's the fire of the Holy Spirit. For as yet he has fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. There are different giftings within the church. Different people have differing gifts within the church. And it's interesting that the Lord uses Peter. Peter has this encounter. He has this revelation. In, in Matthew 16, if you remember, Jesus was at Caesarea Philippi, and he asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Oh, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're one of the prophets. He says, yeah, I know, but, but who do you say? Peter, out of nowhere, says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. But he says, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. And the Lord uses Peter in Jerusalem. You remember on the day of Pentecost. These are not drunk as you supposed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he preached. And now we see that the Lord is using Peter. There in Samaria as the gospel is opening up there. We're going to see him in chapter 10 with a Roman, Cornelius. And God just uses different individuals in different ways. And we're not competing. If you spend your life trying to be like me, you're never going to be the person God brought you into this world to be. We live in a world and it's in the church and it breaks my heart. People trying to pray longer than Sister Spookenbacher. And I've been guilty. I've done that. I, I, I got saved in that type of church. You know, you're down there at the altar. They had altars down. If you don't know what that is, I'll talk to you after church. There's not enough time. Maybe down there at the altar and leaning over the altar and you're praying and seeking the Lord. Oh, and then you just kind of peep open one eye like that. 
looking down the row to see if Sister Spookenbacher is still praying because you got to pray longer than her because everybody knows she's the prayer warrior in the church. Jesus has called you, he's called me to one thing, faithfulness. That's it. I don't have to pray more than you. I don't have to know more scripture than you. All I have to do is be what he's calling and leading me to be. And if I do, you're going to hear the same thing that I'm going to hear. I'm going to hear the same thing that Billy Graham heard. We're going to hear the same thing that Paul the Apostle heard. And Peter, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh. Yes. Well, he had not fallen, verse 16, but they were baptized in the name of Jesus only. They lay their hands on them. They received the Holy Ghost. And then Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And then Peter acted in a way that the modern church would have been offended. He would have been blasted on social media, excommunicated from the fellowship. He says, thy money perish with thee. I won't... I won't translate that literally because we have young ones in our midst. He says, you're going to end up the same place your money's going to end up. Should I? Yeah. Yeah, I should. In history, history tells us that this, this, was, this became known as simony. It took place within the Catholic Church where, where you could pay money and you could, you could pay for your ecclesiastical uh, positions and privileges within the church. And we think, oh, well, good thing we're not Catholic. And, and even if you are Catholic, that doesn't really take place as much. But there's even history that tells us that popes ended up in their position because they paid great sums of money. But lest we look down on those individuals, oh, be careful, Gordon. You may have heard of the school of this miraculous ministry and the school of that miraculous ministry. And if you'll pay a small fee of, you know, two, three thousand dollars and go through our course, go to our school, then you too. We don't have time to turn there, but if you remember in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, then suddenly from heaven there was a sound a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and they all began to speak with unknown tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And in Corinthians, Paul says, there are diversities of gifts, but all of the self-same Spirit, and he divides them severally as he wills. I have a problem with Sister Spukenbacher when she says, I got the gift of... That's between you and God. I don't got no gifts. But the Holy Ghost has a bunch of them. And Jesus will give those out to those who will be humble enough and obedient enough and willing enough to be used in them. As a matter of fact, Paul says, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. I hear people say, well, why don't we see what we used to see in, in the Bible? Why, why don't we see what we used to see? Well, maybe, maybe. It ain't got nothing to do with God. Matter of fact, I know it has nothing to do with God. Where's the desire? Where's that earnest desire for brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God, to say, Lord, sanctify me. Here I am. Set me apart. Use me however you want. Word of wisdom. Tongues, discerning of spirits, it doesn't matter, Lord. However you want to use me, use me, Lord. There's a lot of people in the church like, use him, Lord. I'll benefit from it. Use him, Lord. Thy money perish with you because, notice he says, thou hast thought that the gift of God. If we were one of those repeat after me kind of churches, I'd tell you to repeat after me. You don't buy a gift and you don't, well, I was going to say you don't sell gifts, but I guess sometimes people do sell. They, they re-gift or, or, or sell them if they don't, they don't like them. But when it comes to God's gifts, you can't do that. There are people that think that 
you can. He says, repent, therefore, of this wickedness. And he says, pray, pray, Simon, pray. Perhaps God would forgive you of the thought of your heart. For I perceive, how did Peter know this? How did Peter, how did Peter know that Ananias was going to drop dead? How did Peter know before that that they sold some, some land and kept part of the money and lied to everybody? Mainly to God. There's those gifts. Discernment is a gift of the Holy Spirit. That's not one of the happier ones. I can tell you that. That's not one that you're like, oh, Lord, give me that one. You should desire it because it is a gift of the Holy Spirit and you should be willing to let God use you, but it's, it's not going to be, hey, Gordon, guess what? That brother over there, he's been fasting and praying for three weeks and he's closer to me than he ever has and I'm so proud of him. That's not typically how discernment works. It's, Gordon, you see that brother over there? He's not what people think he is. It's not a happy thing. It's part of it. He says, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Whew. What would he be bitter of? Remember, Luke has just told us that the whole city was swayed by this man. Philip comes along and preaches Christ, and that ain't nobody being swayed by this man. I wonder if that has anything to do with why politicians are against... Uh, okay, don't get in trouble, Gordon. Because he that... The son is set free is free indeed. And when Jesus starts setting people free, you can't control and manipulate them anymore. And so he, he's, he's not happy about this. But notice how he responds, verse 24. And Simon said, pray for me. <laughs> pray ye the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. Peter says, you pray, Simon. No, you, you pray for me. We could speculate until the cows come home, and I don't even know what that means, but I've heard it before. Was he saved? Was he not saved? People are on both sides of the camp. We're not told what ends up happening to him. The Lord just moves on, because look what the next verse says. And they, talking about Peter and John, when they had testified, they preached what? The word. They preached the word of the Lord, returning to Jerusalem, and preaching what? The gospel in many villages of, of the Samaritans. So we don't know what happened to this guy. It's a dangerous thing to think that you can manipulate God. And there's a lot of people who think they can. Well, verse 26. I love this. Hurry up, Gordon. Hurry up. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, You need to stay here for a long time. Man, this revival is happening. This is going to become the next Jerusalem. Man, and you're the founder of it, Philip. You got the stamp of the approval by Peter and John. Boy, you could start you a Samaritan Philippian ministry international. Right in the middle right in the middle of this revival. People are being delivered. People are being healed. People are being saved. The angel of the Lord says to Philip, time to go, buddy. But, 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 wait a minute. Now, it makes sense for me to leave Jerusalem because there's a lot of persecution there, but this is good. I, I don't want to leave. This is it's just getting good. Lord is ju it's just getting good. But notice, the angel of the Lord spake unto him and said, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is desert. Okay, wait a minute. Not only are you asking me to leave a revival, you're telling me to go to the desert? Where in the desert, Lord? If it's the Lord, you'll tell me exactly where. Now I want you to get this. The angel of the Lord says, just go in this direction. Just go in this direction. The way from Jerusalem to Gaza, you just start heading that way. He don't know where he's going. He don't know why he's going. All he knows is, is the angel of the Lord told him to do it. We'll come back to that. 
Verse 27, he says, well, I need to pray and fast, wait for a couple months to see if I can get confirmation on that. No. He arose and went. Can I just remind you of something? This is something that I still struggle with off and on, but it's a truth that I know I'm just wrestling with the living it out. When God speaks to you, you know it. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow. And the voice of a stranger they do not know and will flee from that voice. I think there's far too many Christians, and I've been guilty myself, we're following strange voices. Following strange voices. Well, Lord, is this you? Is this not you? Is this, well, okay, I guess I'll just... If you don't know, don't. If you do know, go. And here's how you'll know. When God tells me to do something, if I don't do it, I'm sinning, and I know I'm sinning. That's how sure it is. It's not, okay, well, I don't know. I'm wondering. I, I don't. That's not how God leads. He's the Prince of Peace. Seek peace. Pursue it. Philip knew. He knew that he knew that he knew that he knew. And look what it says. It says he arose and he went. And behold, there was a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had been in charge of all her treasure and had come from Jerusalem for to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Oh, I love this. I wish we had more time, but we don't. But we'll just kind of hit some highlights, right? There was another queen in the Old Testament of Sheba. And she came because she heard of a man named Solomon. And in Luke, Jesus says, a greater than Solomon has come. But this, this eunuch, this Ethiopian, he's come during the feast and he's heading back and he's still searching. He's, he, he's reading because he didn't find there what he was looking for. Now, I've heard people say, this is the argument, maybe you've heard it. Well, what about that long lost tribal person on the other end of Timbuktu and he ain't never heard the gospel before? What about them? I always take those individuals to this text. Because I believe with all my heart, if there is a seeker anywhere, God will move heaven and earth. He'll send his man from the revival into a desert, seemingly making no sense to reach that one person. So you don't have to worry about that tribal person somewhere out there in some distant land who God's going to just let be and go to hell. No, not so. Not my God. Not true. Philip, head to Gaza. Okay, Lord. But notice, it, it keeps moving. Verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near unto thyself to this chariot. Okay, I'm in Gaza. When did he get the next set of instructions? Okay, that's not a trick question. <laughs> when, when he got to where he was going, go to Gaza. Okay. If he would have stayed in Samaria, he would have never heard the Spirit say this. Let me tell you why. Because this is a divine appointment. Time is precious with this, this taking place. I mean, the, the timing is amazing when you think about it. This man's on this chariot, and he's making his way back. To Ethiopia and he just so happens you know by chance as it happens you know look of <laughs> no he's reading in Isaiah now I don't know when he started reading Isaiah but we're about to find out he's at Isaiah 53 the gospel according to Isaiah I had intended to read it time is not going to permit us if you have never read it read it especially pay attention to the pronouns he and he there's two he's and then the we, us, and thems, and you go through it, and it's like, oh, wow. The Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip moseyed over there. Oh, when I get around to it. He ran. He, I love this. And this is important. When God tells you to do it, do it. Do it. What, I love this, this new song that Victor and the band did. If you say, if you say jump, <laughs> I'm diving in. It's, it's or something, whatever it was. That's, you get the idea. You were here. 
He ran, and it's important that he ran, because notice, he ran to him, and he heard him reading Isaiah, and he says, boy, this is spiritual. You know, you've you got to go to school to learn how to do this type of, this level of witnessing stuff. Do you understand what you read? What? He just started a conversation, and the guy says, how can I understand except a man guide me? And he desired Philip. First, we had instruction from the angel. Then we had inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Then we had an invitation from the Ethiopian. God's working, but it was step by step by step by step. He had to get near to the chariot to hear he was reading in Isaiah. Oh, some of you aren't getting this. When he got there in verse 32, he was at the place of the scripture, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before her shearers, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Wow. I mean, man, that's, what a chance, right? No. It's the divine appointment. And the eunuch answered, verse 34, and Philip, and he says, Hey, I, I pray you, um, whom speaketh the prophet? This. If you're not asking questions when you read the Bible, you ain't reading the Bible right. I want to say that again. If you're not asking questions when you read the Bible, you're not reading the Bible right. Who, what, when, where, why, how? So what? Now that I've, what, is, what does the text say? What does the text mean? And how should I respond to it? Who is he talking about? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? And Philip opened his mouth. Oh, I'm going to say it. I hate it. And I've even said it myself. Here it comes. Oh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to Listerine my mouth after I say this. Preach the gospel and use words if you have to. Ooh. I think I just vomited in my mouth. You have to. Philip opened his mouth. I want to remind you, there is no way to preach the gospel and not open your mouth. And look what he preached. Jesus. Jesus has searched the scriptures for them you think you have life and they are they that testify of me. John 5, 39. We ought to be able to at any place point people to Jesus. From Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21, it's all about him. And if we're missing that, we've missed it all. They went a little further. They came to a body of water. He says, hey, what hinders me to be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all thine heart, you may. I don't know, maybe he was considering Simon. Hey, if you really believe, if you really believe. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both of them, into the water. They both went down into the water with no sprinkling going on. They were fully immersed in the water. They both went down into the water. But Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Where'd he go? He gone. One of these days, that's going to happen to me if I live long enough. One minute I'm going to be here. Where'd he go? People say, well, there's no examples in the Scripture of, of any catching away. In John chapter 6, remember Jesus come walking to the disciples on the water? They were rowing and they were struggling and Jesus, they willingly received Jesus into the boat and, and, and the scripture says, immediately, they were at the shore. Just, there he is, there he goes. Hollywood's been copying that for years, or trying to. And notice what happens to the Ethiopian. He said, where'd he go? What am I going to do without Philip? How am I going to go on without Philip? i got to have this man of God. He's got Jesus now. 
He came from Jerusalem. He saw all the, the feasts and he saw everything going in the temple. Apparently, he took and spent a lot of money for this scroll of Isaiah. And he's searching. He's educated. He's searching. He's looking. He come away from Jerusalem empty, but now he's full. He's found what he had been looking for. And he goes away rejoicing. I don't know where that guy went. I don't care. I got Jesus. And that's all that matters. Doesn't matter who leaves you in this life. It doesn't matter how they leave. If you've got Jesus, you're okay. You're okay. Well, one more verse. And Philip was found, poof, in his otis. In his otis, which is Ashdod, which was one of the five strongholds of the Philistines in the Old Testament. He, he's just found there. And he doesn't stay there. He's passing through and he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I know I'm out of time, and I know I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm going to just have to be in trouble. We're going to wrap this up. One step at a time. One step at a time. That's how God works. The Lord didn't dispatch the angel to Philip and say, Now listen, Philip, here's what's going to happen. You're going to leave Samaria here and you're going to go towards Gaza the way people go from Jerusalem to Gaza. And when you get there, you're going to see this chariot and you're going to, you're going to see an Ethiopian on this chariot. And that Ethiopian on the chariot is going to be reading a scroll. That scroll is going to be Isaiah and he's going to be in Isaiah 53. That's where he's going to be. He's going to ask you to get up on the chariot and then you're going to come across the brook, a little body of water. And when you come across that body of water, he's going to ask you to baptize him. And you're going to baptize him. And when you get through baptizing him, I'm just going to catch you away and I'm going to take you to your next mission. And that's what some of us are waiting for. Some of you are waiting for that, that grand introduction with all the details of the instructions. But Jesus said something interesting in the Gospels. He said, he that is faithful in the least shall be faithful in much. And some of you are sitting here and you've not done anything with the last step. And you're wondering, Lord, what do you want me to do now? Where am I going to go from here? And the Lord's going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because this is how he does it, step by step. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. A lamp is not a big spotlight. It's not a big lighthouse, you know, you know. 14,000 lumens, you know, LED lights, you know, melting everything in its path. That's not a lamp unto my feet. I can see the next step and the next step. And as I walk, the path becomes more and more clear. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, but it doesn't stop there. It's a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. The good news about all of this is I know where I'm going. I know the destination. I can see the glow of the city from where I am. I can see the lights of the city. In this dark world I'm in, I can see it. It's a light into my path. I know where I'm heading. I won't lose sight of where I'm heading if I, heading if I stay in here. And, and I'll get one step, the next step, the next step. Oh. And let me just share with you what happened in the life of that type of person. Real quick as we close. In Acts chapter 6, we were introduced to this man named Philip. And we saw that he was faithful in the fellowship. In church. If Philip was here this morning, he, 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 was faith, he would be faithful in this fellowship. Uh, we need some help in the widow's ministry. <laughs> what? Send another widow over there. They like talking to each other. What do I got in common with a widow? He was faithful in the fellowship. He was willing to serve wherever. It didn't matter. Do you know that servants don't have the luxury of choosing their service? We don't like the thought of this, but a slave does whatever his or her master tells them to do. That's just the way it is. 
go wait on the widows. Yes, sir. Wait on the widows. Go change that diaper. Okay, change that diaper. I heard a preacher this week say that he had a, a worship pastor that he had just hired on staff and, and they were there at church during the day and the pastor was lining up chairs in the sanctuary for the next service and, and the, worship, the new worship pastor walked by and he says to the worship pastor, he says, hey, um, how about giving me a hand with these chairs? And he stopped for a minute and gave him a puzzling look and he said, I don't know how to do that. And he said, oh, no big deal. Come over here, I'll show you. And so he started showing him how to do it. And he says, he got to doing his thing, and after a while, he looked around and realized the guy was gone. The youth, I mean, the, the, the worship pastor was gone. And so he, he, he met up with him, found him out, and he says, hey, what's going on? He says, God didn't call me to straighten chairs up in a sanctuary. He didn't, no, this is his, he, said, he said, God didn't call me here to, to rearrange chairs in the sanctuary. And the pastor looked at him and says, no, I think you added too many words to that. You should have stopped with this. God didn't call me here. Because this is part of the ministry here. And so, so he was faithful in the fellowship. He was willing to serve. Then we see him here in this chapter, chapter 8. He's fruitful in the field. He's fruitful in the field. He, he goes from the fellowship. He goes out there in the world. He's fruitful in the field. Not only is he a server. Oh, he's a server. He's a sower. And we've, we've reviewed the preaching. When he has a conversation with you, he's talking scripture. That's all a man. Every time I'm talking, he's going to throw a scripture at you. That's it. If you talk to me, we're going to talk about the Bible, or at least you're going to listen to it. Because that's the conversation. We're going to eventually talk about Jesus because that's all there is worth talking about. He's a server and he's a sower. We only see him three times in the book of Acts. Chapter 6, here in chapter 8, and the next time we see him, we're going to see him in chapter 21. And Paul, in all of his company, is going to spend the night at Philip's house. Twenty years later, still in Caesarea, as a fulfilled father. He's faithful in the fellowship. He's fruitful in the field. And he's fulfilled as a father. Because not only is he a server, not only is he a sower, of the seed he's a sculptor he's a sculptor and you know what's interesting quickly as we close jesus is all of these things just like stephen and as we look at stephen and go oh i want to be like that guy no you don't what you really want to be like is jesus because that's what you're seeing in stephen the same with philip you say oh i want to be faithful in the fellowship then you're going to have to be like jesus who girded himself with a towel and was willing to wash feet. Because that's Jesus. If you're going to be like, if you're going to be fruitful in the field out there in the world, then you're going to have to be a sower. You're going to have to change your conversation. You're going to have to be that guy, that gal, that people are like, oh, every time we talk to her, every time we talk to him. You don't have to talk to me. That's fine. I won't be upset with you if you don't talk to me. But if you do, and he's a sculptor. Jesus is the potter. And he shaves and he smooths and he molds and he shapes. And that's the beauty of Jesus in the life of an individual. It works in the church. It works in the world. And it works in the house. But you've got to be willing. I've got to be willing. We've got to be willing to take one step at a time. You can't get out ahead of him. You can't fall back. You've got to follow Jesus with every step of your life.